What comes to mind when you think of underwater connections? Tunnels like the railway tunnel across the English Channel? Underwater pipelines carrying oil and gas like Nord Stream? Oh wait, there are around 5 billion internet users worldwide, which translates to 60% of the world's population. What started as a late 1960s Cold War military project called ARPANET, a network that could maintain communication even in the event of a nuclear attack, evolved in the 1990s with the World Wide Web, where users could access and share information through a browser. And here we are with the ability to find more information than what kings and presidents had in the 1980s, ability to conduct e-commerce around the world, stream to millions of users, take courses at top universities, and connect with users around the world. This is made possible because of a complex network of some 550 underwater fiber optic cables laid at the bottom of the oceans at a depth of up to 8,000 meters below the surface, which is as deep as Mount Everest is high, and can be as long as 39,000 kilometers or 24,000 miles, which when plotted from one end to the other is close to the circumference of Earth. Companies like Meta and Google have invested hundreds of millions if not billions in more than a dozen undersea cable projects sometimes together on the same project, like a cable dubbed Echo, to connect the US with Singapore. These cables are crucial to the modern way of life with deeply fascinating implications on geopolitics, tech, and economics. But to understand how fiber optic cables work, we have to rewind the clock all the way back to 1851 when the first underwater cable was laid across the English Channel. The technology at the time was the telegraph, where messages had to be translated into Morse code, which then travels as electric signals to the receiving end and is translated back into text. A few years later, in 1858, the first transatlantic telegraph cable was built between the west coast of Ireland and Newfoundland. It was not until 1956, decades after the invention of the telephone, when the first undersea telephone cable called the TAT-1 was laid between Scotland and Newfoundland. And fast forward a few more decades and the world shifted to the vastly superior technology of fiber optic cables, with the first transatlantic cable laid down in 1988 with the TAT-8. With these fiber optic cables, the data is encoded as pulses of light through the hundreds of fiber optics made of glass and measuring only the diameter of a human hair and enclosed in a cable about the size of a garden hose. It can achieve mind-boggling data transfer speeds of 26 terabits per second, like the Morea cable running from the east coast of the US to Spain, which for the sake of comparison would be enough to stream almost a million 4K films at once. Currently there are more than 550 cables in the world and the combined length of all the cables there is a whopping 1.4 million kilometers, enough to circle around the world 35 times over. As the importance of undersea cables increases, the security of cables is increasingly a concern. Not just from environmental factors like earthquakes and animals that can disrupt the connection, but from deliberate human sabotage. Russia for its part has threatened to quote, destroy the ocean floor cable communications of our enemies, in retaliation for the blowing of the Nord Stream pipelines. How disruptive this would be in reality is anyone's guess. Certainly for small countries with just one undersea cable connected to it, it would be a crippling blow. But look at the number of cables connected to say, the UK, and the logistics of of cutting enough to cause a disruption, without being detected, to say nothing of satellite backups. That hasn't stopped countries from displaying a degree of concern about security. To not do so would be reckless. Take Australia for example, which in 2017 blocked the plan from Huawei to install a 4000 km long undersea cable called the Coral Sea Cable System, linking Sydney to the Solomon Islands over fears of surveillance, which mind you can also happen from divers with special equipment brought in from submarines. This was the case in the Cold War when the US was able to attach equipment to Soviet cables and intercept communication for years before they were caught, but that was the era of undersea telephone cables, while 99% of cables are now fiber optics, and we don't even know if or how many cables have been compromised. Even the consortium of companies that build these cables can be confusing, which leads to the next section on tech. Now, most tech companies don't have their own data centers to run their applications and services. They rely on cloud providers like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Compute. Which is to say, only the biggest tech companies have the scale and resources to justify building out their own data centers, which cost in the order of hundreds of millions to build out around the world, and which they rent out to other companies as excess capacity. The same can be true for undersea cables. While traditionally the domain of telecommunication providers like AT&T, the same big players like Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Google are the ones investing heavily because they have the massive data center traffic and already have big expenses for capacity on existing cables. While citizens of the countries the cables are connected to benefit from faster speeds, the real benefit of sole or part ownership in the cables is having dedicated, 
reliable, secure capacity for their own needs, especially in the less connected parts of Asia and Africa. This marks a big shift in how things operated. For more than 150 years, telecom companies owned all the cables and mostly abstained from meddling in the content transmitted, leaving that to the newspapers and broadcasters, what we call legacy media today. Companies like Google and Meta on the other hand are content providers and platforms which have the power to influence what people see and read, in addition to also owning and operating a vast chunk of the global internet infrastructure, concentrating more power onto the few. Given the selfish motives and security risks, why are more and more cables greenlit to be built? The answer lies in economics. Certain countries have a tougher time developing their economy and standard of living. In the past few decades, we've seen countries like South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan move from an agrarian economy to a low-cost manufacturing economy to advanced economies, and one of the factors is how connected a country is due to being able to attract investment, foster innovation, and create jobs in the tech sector, to say nothing of telemedicine and education opportunities, etc. Geography plays a role in this. A country like Indonesia with its thousands of islands requires hundreds of undersea cables just to connect the country to itself, with many islands with slow or no connection. In parts of Canada's north, there are areas where the terrain combined with the remoteness makes it not cost effective to upgrade its terrestrial internet with the laying of new fiber optic cables. In those regions, satellites like those from Starlink can fill the void. In conclusion, while the technology has its roots from over 100 years ago, it has evolved to become indispensable with the number of undersea cables increasing yearly even as mass constellations are being built. Both coexist as each provides unique benefits over the other with the same end goal of a world that is more connected than ever even in the least developed, most remote parts of the world. While bringing positive benefits, it also solidifies a more formidable moat and a greater control for the tech companies who already have a lot of control. So if you like this video, please give a like, comment, share, and subscribe. This is Inside Sync, and thank you for watching.